Our next grand keynote is Dr. Vishal Sikka. He's CEO of Infosys. Uh, Dr. Sikka joined Infosys in 2014 to help transform the company during a time of significant change in the services industry. Since joining Infosys, Dr. Sikka has implemented strategy of helping clients renew their existing IT landscapes and at the time, same time bring breakthrough innovation non-disruptively. Prior to joining Infosys, Dr. Sikka was a member of the executive board of SAP SE, leading all products and technologies, including all of product development and uh, innovation globally. Dr. Sikka is the creator of Timeless Software, a framework which articulates the principles of renewing existing processes and landscape without disruption to customer environments. Dr. Sikka received his BS in computer science from Syracuse University. He holds a PhD in computer science from Stanford University. And it's my pleasure to introduce a strong supporter, well-wisher, and long-time sponsor for Tycon. Dr. Sikka, please. Thank you, Saurav. You have the clicker. Thank you, Saurav. Good morning, everyone. You guys don't sound like you are awake yet. <laughs> the uh, most of the this is all the uh, Indian mafia of the valley. So there is the Indian Standard Time, which uh, I have become quite accustomed to in the last 21 months. The uh, uh, Infosys, as you all know, is a services company and a pioneering services company in many ways. And I've been uh, CEO for the last little bit more than 21 months. and. Uh, there has been a great change that is underway, um, led directly, um, it is resulting directly from, from AI, from the work in artificial intelligence that has been going on, actually for many decades, but certainly has become quite, uh, uh, quite exciting and also there is a lot, it's a lot in the news over the last couple of years. So uh, it has a profound impact uh, on the future of services. So I thought when, uh, when Venk asked me to, at the last minute, come here and, and give a talk to all of you, I thought I'll talk to you about services in this time uh, of AI. The, um, just to set the context on that, um, when we look at what is going on around us, and it is very difficult to capture what is going on around us in a, uh, in a, in a very, in a brief and succinct manner, the uh, Shantanu, my friend Shantanu, just did a, an extraordinary job of capturing uh, some key aspects of that. Uh, in particular, the fact that experience um, is, uh, uh, is, is one of the great foundations on which modern businesses and, and modern services and products are increasingly being built. So my sense of uh, what is going on around us, it is always great to capture any particular time, any particular innovation around the three dimensions that design thinking teaches us, which is the desirability of a, of a product or a service or an innovation, which is how, how much uh, appeal does that have to an end user, the feasibility of it, which is the engineering, and all of us technologists and engineers uh, tend to be fixated on that, but it, and it is a very vital part of any innovation, but it is one of the three parts. Uh, and the third one, of course, is, is uh, viability, which is the economics. So when you look at it from this particular point of view, what we see that is happening around us is there is a very pervasive focus on end user experience, on end user centricity. And this is what Shantanu talked about. Um, the power of infrastructure, uh, computing infrastructure, Moore's law just finished 51 years. Um, and, um, uh, and the intelligent systems that are now increasingly possible on that um, and the extreme efficiency, the ease of disintermediation that is resultant from that, I believe are the three big things that are going on. So let me quickly talk about these three. Here are three examples that I just picked of, um, uh, of end user centricity. The, uh, on the left, you see some work that, that we have done uh, together with Carnegie Mellon University on virtual reality recently. And, uh, this work is quite exciting. It is still in the early stages. Uh, virtual reality is still in the early stages. The headsets remind you of those old brick phones that you would, you know, put next to your uh, your head like this and feel very proud that it was a there was this eight thousand dollar two kilogram 
you know, phone that you are lugging around. And uh, um, in a few years, obviously, the virtual reality sets will all disappear into incredibly small and thin things. But today, we are in this time where we have to put the headphones on and put this giant thing in front of your eyes. And then 10% of the people actually get nauseated. Uh, and it is not because of the horrible experience of the things that people put inside the VR headsets. Um, but once we get this right, uh, I believe that virtual reality is going to have a huge impact in how we consume information, how we experience things. Um, and, and augmented reality, I believe, will fade inside virtual reality as one aspect of it. After all, in a truly virtual reality, all kinds of worlds are possible, and the actual world that we are augmenting is only one of them. So the AR will become an instance of VR. That is my sense. Chat and bot interfaces uh, have become um, quite uh, popular. Again, this is because of uh, end user centricity, the end user's experience. Um, so we are still in the early days of good chat and bot interfaces, as recent examples suggest to us. Um, and there is a lot of innovation going on in immersive spaces, in redesigning the spaces that we are in, uh, whether it is retail spaces or um, cars or houses, uh, reimagining in a physical space to become increasingly digital. And this is being fueled, obviously, by dramatic advances in hardware. Every time, every six months or nine months or so, I, I do a pulse check on what is going on in the world of hardware just to stay in connected with reality. And what is going on in the world of hardware is, is quite extraordinary. Um, it is in the nature of the human brain that we don't uh, keep track of. We cannot easily comprehend exponentials. And the fact that engineers not far from here, in fact, within a couple of kilometers of here, uh, have invented, um, um, uh, Moore, Gordon Moore invented Moore's law, and that engineers over the last 51 years have managed to keep that going is just one of the most incredible achievements, uh, I believe, that humans have made ever. And um, you see on the left here, some of these new servers from, from Intel, these are extraordinarily powerful. Um, the, the new Broadwell chips and the Skylake chips that are coming out um, have extraordinary power. I saw this new light, Knight's Landing processor with 64 cores on it um, that is either available already or will be available soon. The amount of computing that we can now bring uh, is simply extraordinary. Um, it is uh, on a single rack, we can put uh, more than uh, 1,000 CPU cores. We can put more than 25 terabytes of DRAM. And uh, this is just an extraordinary power. Um, and on the other hand, by the way, what I mean by the crossover there is this year an extraordinary thing has happened. Uh, we tend to live in these times, time goes by like a blur, we lose sight of what is going on around us. But just in the last few months, uh, in the last two or three months, uh, a, a monumental crossover has happened. Uh, the number of units of computing sold to cloud companies has now exceeded the ones being sold to enterprises. This was not supposed to happen for another few years, but it has already happened in the first half of 2016. Uh, in terms of economics, because the cloud units are still much cheaper than the units being sold to enterprises, the, in terms of economics, this will still happen four years or so from now. But in terms of the number of units sold, clouds are buying more computing already than enterprises. This is just an incredible achievement that has happened. Um, on the small end of the spectrum, there is this moat. That moat is actually sitting on a 10 cent coin on a dime. Uh, you can see that it is about the size of the three characters there. Uh, this is made by the University of Michigan. It is called the M3. It's about a cubic millimeter in size, and it has uh, it can be made in three different configurations with different kinds of sensors on it. Um, so already it is at a point where um, you can put these moats inside, you know, things that we drink, and and you pretty much won't know that you have consumed a sensor. Um, I was telling my friend Indra recently that um, soon you will be able to put tens of sensors inside a, a can of Diet Pepsi, and uh, uh, they will go inside and do who knows what. And uh, 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 you know, so so the same innovations is happening on the small end as well. And then the third picture you see is the specialized hardware, the GPU-based hardware that is increasingly becoming the foundation for artificial intelligence work. And again, there is a tremendous set of innovations that is going on. Uh, this, this particular board is from NVIDIA. 
um, and, and others are working on similar kinds of things. So tremendous advances in intelligence systems, which are of course uh, powering advances in software. Um, and uh, here on the left you see an example of uh, a chain of driverless trucks. Several vendors, big and small, came together recently to drive trucks, autonomous self-driving trucks that drove for several thousand miles uh, in Europe. Um, and they did things like pooling and so forth, crossed customs, crossed borders, paid taxes. Uh, that was an awesome achievement that happened. Uh, in the middle you see uh, some work that we have done together with GE um, on uh, an intelligent landing gear uh, that goes inside airplanes, where the landing gear is continuously connected with the atmosphere around us, whether it is on the ground or in the air, um, and uh, reports on its, its health, its uh, the opportunity to predict the, the behavior of it and so on. And a consortium recently was started uh, that we at Infosys were very proud to be a part of uh, called OpenAI that uh, is working on creating AI technologies in the public good. So there is a tremendous set of advances happening in intelligence systems and infrastructure which is powering all the big disruptions that we see around us which is in essence rewriting almost every industry. And the result of these two, uh, the a deep experience uh, focus uh, and extreme advances in infrastructure, is that it has become easier than it has ever been to disrupt an incumbent in any industry. We already see examples of, of Tesla, a, a, car, a, a technology company that has become a leading car company, uh, examples of others, uh, Airbnb and, and so forth. The, um, a simple characterization of what this phenomenon is all about is as we transition increasingly from the world of atoms into the world of bits, uh, there is a great shift that happens. In the world of atoms, between the, the production and the, and the consumption, lots of intermediaries form. Uh, each intermediary uh, ends up feeling the need to add its own bells and whistles, to add its own elements of value. But each one of these intermediaries ends up obfuscating that chain that exists between the production and the consumption, it ends up making it inefficient. And that inefficiency manifests in price on the one hand, uh, in awareness of the consumption and the demand on the other hand, et cetera. And in the world of bits, of course, things are much simpler. You have digital marketplaces, even if, if even that, uh, that connect directly or as directly as possible the production to the consumption. And that leads to Obviously, it leads to disintermediation, but it leads to much more elastic pricing. It leads to much more real-time awareness of demand and consumption. So whether you look at Uber or Airbnb or, or Tesla or any one of these marketplaces that are disrupting traditional industries um, in a highly simplified way, this is basically what is going on. And this, of course, is going on in the world of services as well. Uh, one example I have here, this is uh, one of the amazing notions that I was not aware of, or conceptually aware of, but it hit me like a truck when I came to Infosys, was this idea of a bench. Every quarter in the earnings calls, we report on the bench, on utilization. And with a 200,000 employee company, my bench is actually, right now, this morning, while I was driving here, I saw today's status. We have something like 9,000 people on the bench. This is people who are trained, who have, been, who have gone to Mysore, to our education center, who are capable of working, but are not working. And I just find this to be an incredible concept that we have this huge bench, and every company reports on the size of their bench as if it is a completely normal concept. And, and, and I just find it to be an absolutely appalling idea that 9,000 people can sit on a bench and do nothing. Um, it's, it's just one of these um, absolutely moral wrongs that the services industry has become totally used to. Um, my entire application development team at SAP was smaller than the size of the Infosys bench. Um, and I, I just, 21 months into it, I simply cannot relate to this idea. Um, so anyhow, one thing that we have done about it, you know, as an entrepreneur, like Shantanu was saying, you have to do something about it, uh, otherwise you are not a real entrepreneur. So we put together this, back in July, we launched this marketplace called Zero Bench, and as you can see, uh, this slide actually is from December, when we had just crossed 9,500 jobs on this. These are internal jobs that we have put together on, uh, on our own. Um, and, and actually yesterday, 
the number of jobs on the zero bench marketplace is, uh, has just crossed 15,000. Uh, so we have 15,000 jobs, which is the number of jobs is more than the number of people on the bench. This was the first goal of this particular exercise, is that nobody who is sitting on the bench um, sh should be there uh, without access to something purposeful, something interesting, something valuable that they could be working on while they are on the bench. Um, the 15,000 jobs means that uh, close to 80% of our bench has already done some work or the other. These are internal jobs, some innovation ideas, uh, our product development, our IT work that people on the bench work on. And actually it breaks a very na uh, nasty, vicious cycle that exists inside services companies. People are on the bench because they don't have something to do and then they don't have something to do because they are on the bench. Um, and so this actually gives them some great experience while they are on there. And one great experiment that we are working on right now is to actually expose this outside uh, so that uh, uh, we have our own bench and our people are actually connected directly to the outside marketplace. Uh, again, in zero time, um, you know, with this uh, example that I mentioned earlier about the bits world, where you can have direct connection between the production and the, and the consumption. So based on all of this, people ask me, you know, what is Infosys strategy or when you do consulting and strategic work with large companies, what advice do you give to companies? Um, a generic advice, a generic strategy that I believe applies not only to Infosys but to every company is this basic idea of a dual velocity innovation. Um, renew on the one hand where you are constantly renewing your core business, you are constantly reinventing it because you already have it, you already have customers, markets, products, services, supply chains, operations, everything figured out, but you are constantly improving on it. We can think of this as being better, constantly being better. But in parallel, you have to do things that are completely new, things that we never did before, things that are changing the paradigm, uh, and that you can think of as new, and or as being different to who you are. Um, and the re this duality of renew and new sits on a foundation of culture, which is the core values of who you are as a company. And one can think of that as both staying true to those values, as well as being in a constant state of improving. So being better, being uh, different, and being improving are the three dimensions of any company's ability to reinvent itself. The uh, Arthur Kostler wrote about this in 1964 in this great book called The Act of Creation. And, uh, he characterized this dual velocity. He talked about this idea of, uh, of a pink plane, um, that the act of creation lies in this self-consistent but habitually incompatible. Um, Shantanu referred to this idea of antibodies. Uh, self-consistent. They cannot be inconsistent, otherwise you have two different companies. Um, but they have to be self-consistent, but they have to be habitually different. Um, and the, the pink plane is this continuous improvement on things that you did, things that you already know about, and breakthrough in innovation in things that are new to you uh, and so forth. And you do so while improving yourself culturally. And that cultural dimension ends up being about things like, like education, about learning, things like uh, connecting to the employees, always being aware, and things of this nature. So in my world, in the world of services, the renew and new manifest itself as a cycle of automation and innovation, and the culture manifests itself as constant education, a continually learning, continually improving uh, workforce. So I want to talk a little bit about, about that, and in particular about how AI is having a huge impact on this renewal of Infosys, um, as well as of I, I believe it will have to have for all services companies. The, you know, I, I did my graduate studies in AI and when I left SAP and, and I came to Infosys, I started to look into what is going on in the world of AI in more detail. And um, turns out that actually conceptually from an advances in the underlying technologies perspective, this is difficult to say in Silicon Valley, but not much new has happened in AI. 
when I did my, my PhD studies at Stanford, um, my, my PhD is in fact in a part of AI. And um, back in the 70s, up to the 70s, tremendous amount of breakthrough work was going on in AI. Uh, in the early 90s, when I was at Stanford, I spent a summer at Intel working on using AI in the semiconductor manufacturing process over a memorable summer that I spent here just a mile from where we are sitting and standing. And when I look at what is going on with deep learning and all of these big words that are thrown around these days, actually the conceptual advances are not that new. Yes, the computers are millions of times more powerful. The cost performance has improved even more than millions of times since then. Uh, but the underlying technology has not, and I hope that, and certainly with OpenAI, it is our hope that we can actually improve the quality of the innovations themselves, the, the techniques themselves. But nonetheless, and the, the other disappointing thing is that the problems that people are applying AI, AI to are by and large trivial problems. They're like finding cats in videos and, and, and um, uh, is the cat dancing and is the cat sleeping and is the cat hungry and heaven forbid is the cat about to leave. Um, that sort of thing. Yes, there is work going on in autonomous driving and, and some areas, but generally the purposeful, you know, useful applications of AI are still few and far between. So when, when we were thinking about what is it, what is a great problem that enterprises have that we could bring to AI, we thought about a very basic problem, the constant renewal. Every enterprise, every business has this constant headache of how do I reinvent my systems and actually how do I reinvent my business processes so that I am constantly serving my customers with the best possible experience or am I susceptible to disruption from some innovator because I am using old systems and I don't know how to connect in to consumers using chat and how do I connect to them using mobile and how do I connect to them using virtual reality. You know, the delivery of the great experience uh, and the continuous reinvention of your system landscape so that you can be current, continually modern and relevant is the biggest problem that we could think of that we could apply AI to. So how might we reimagine that with AI? And it turns out that when you look at this problem of reinvention of, of the IT landscape or reinvention of the system landscape if you are a manufacturing company beyond the IT landscape, there are these three complex dimensions. There is the complexity of the operations, ongoing complexity of maintenance. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of people, and usually they are from services companies like mine, who are operating and maintaining these systems. There is the fragmentation of knowledge. Yesterday I was on a call with one of our huge clients here in the US, um, and they were telling us about this tribal knowledge that disappears when people leave, when people retire, and so forth. So capture of knowledge that is independent of generations, independent of technology, is a huge problem. And then the process stagnation that I already talked about. The fact that you are constantly behind an eight ball on delivering the best experience to your consumers and you are susceptible to disruption because somebody else will come and uh, deliver these experiences much better than you can. So what if you could use AI to solve these three problems? What if you could use AI to automate and dramatically improve the cost and the performance of the maintenance of these systems so that you can free up the money to innovate? What if you could capture the know-how that is inside these, these legacy systems so that the know-how can last across generations? I mean, Boeing makes airplanes, and we help them capture the know-how so that, I mean, an airplane lives for 100 years, and it sees five generations of maintenance crews over that. When we talk about mainframe systems in the IT world, Actually, physical systems are even more complex. Uh, ABB makes power systems that have sometimes a 100-year-long maintenance contract. Um, so how do you capture knowledge so that the, uh, tribality, the tribal aspect of it can go away and we can capture that knowledge across generations? And how do we continually uh, reinvent that? So um, using AI, we improve the processes constantly and improve the experience. So what is that solution? Well. In the services world, of course, the solution would have been people, right? A bunch of people show up. Um, well, the people still show up, but we are calling this system MANA, Infosys MANA. Uh, 
The idea of MANA is an AI platform that helps us capture the knowledge that sits inside these complicated systems, that helps us use AI, um, knowledge representation and probabilistic reasoning and things like that to understand the behavior of systems, that helps us use AI, natural language processing and, and things like this to capture the uh, understanding even of the source code, the legacy source code of these systems, to understand the documentation of these systems and so forth, and use machine learning, regression, statistical techniques, things like this, to understand and forecast the behavior of these systems, um, and basically bring a collection of AIs. Uh, Marvin Minsky talked about not one technique for AI, but a society of mind. He wrote this great book in 1985 called The Society of Mind. If you're truly interested in AI, you should read that. It's actually a beautiful book. Every chapter is just one page long. There are a couple hundred chapters in the book. and. Um, uh, it is, I, am, I find it very surprising that even academic researchers in AI these days have completely forgotten all of these, all of these things. So anyhow, the MANA platform has all these software capabilities. They are all based on open source components as much as possible. And we are writing a lot of this software ourselves. We have a lot of AI experts. Uh, and whenever we write a piece of software, we open source that as well. And then we surround that with services. So instead of just people doing this work, there is the software. At the, in the middle of it that is also doing this work. Uh, here are some examples, some screens of, um, of MANA, uh, of how we can do forecasting of events that are about to happen. Uh, we applied this to chillers. Um, chillers are large air conditioning systems that, um, that cool buildings, um, HVACs and so forth. Um, in our Mysore campus last year, uh, one of the chillers went down. Uh, for two weeks, it was down because of a fuel leak. And when the chiller goes down, especially in the hot uh, temperatures, uh, you basically cannot work there anymore. So the buildings have to be evacuated and, and so forth. So it's a huge problem if a chiller goes down. And in particular, in uh, environments like, like hospitals and, and airplanes and so forth, these machines cannot fail. It turned out that, and we did this work together with Johnson Controls, which make these chillers. Um, when we looked at with the MANA platform, uh, this, the, the, this chiller, we could forecast one week in advance that it was going to fail, that there were things building up which were going to lead to a fuel leak. This was already visible, clearly visible, one week in advance. Actually, symptoms were available as far back as 10 days in advance. You have plenty of time to react to it, to take preemptive measures, to fix the problem, and so forth. Um, and then on the IT, this is an example in the physical world. It applies to everything, to turbines, to I mentioned landing gears earlier, uh, to engines, to uh, also to small, smaller things, copiers, printers, uh, all kinds of machines. But in the IT world, it's the same thing. When you maintain complex legacy systems, when you have to evolve, people talk about moving systems to the cloud. But it's not easy to move systems to the cloud because people still have, there are billions of lines of COBOL code that is still sitting there in actively being written to this day. Um, as horrifying as that thought is, it is actually happening. Um, so capturing this know-how from IT systems is another one. So I have an example there of um, helping a maintenance engineer maintain legacy code by using AI and pointing them to where the bug needs to be fixed and, uh, and things like that. And an L3 bug in a legacy system can take weeks to solve. And uh, we believe that with uh, bringing AI to that problem, uh, with MANA, we can dramatically shrink the amount of time it takes an engineer to, to get there. So this is a great example of, um, um, of, uh, of MANA and um, uh, of, of using AI in the enterprise. And, but this is one example. The basic approach that we are after is to bring AI, to bring software, to help amplify the life of, um, uh, of an engineer in a services company. And um, the other dimension of that, obviously, is education. We are heavily focused on education. Um, of course, Infosys, one of the things that I was amazed by when I started at Infosys was the extraordinary focus that Infosys has on education. Um, we have our own corporate university in Mysore. It is the largest corporate university in the world. We can teach 15,000 people in parallel anything we want. Um, 
But as it turns out, the rate of change in technology is so fast that even if you have your own university and your own teaching platform, you still cannot teach everyone all the, th all the techniques that are necessary that are out there. So we have partnered with all three of these great companies of our times uh, in education, Coursera, uh, Udacity, and edX, which is a nonprofit out of MIT and Harvard. Um, we have our own foundation uh, here in the US run by, by Vandana, my wife, uh, which is uh, focused on co bringing computer science education to everyone. And just like OpenAI, we are working together with Y Combinator and groups like this to bring uh, advances in learning research itself, the techniques, the tools that we use to help people learn new concepts. Um, why? For a very simple reason. If AI becomes pervasive, or when AI becomes pervasive, we have to realize that the only way that we will have as people to make ourselves relevant in the whatever the job economy is of that time is education. We have to help people teach things, and that means also we need to improve the way that we um, the way that we teach itself. So that is basically what we have been doing: uh, renew and new on a foundation of culture. Um, one example that I want to point out, for a company like ours, it is easy to set up a lab in Silicon Valley and in Israel and Berlin and places like this and say we have innovation, uh, hire 30 smart people who are innovators. But that misses the point of innovation. You have to create a culture of innovation that is pervasive across the company. And this is what we have been trying to do. And one great example that I'm really proud of that I want to mention is something that you see um, there called ZD, that's zero distance. Uh, we started an initiative to inspire every team in Infosys, no matter who they are, no matter what project they are working on, to innovate. And this, this initiative is called zero distance. Again, the idea is the same idea that I talked about earlier, to bring uh, our pe people in direct contact with customers and have them work on uh, bringing innovation to whatever it was that, that they were doing, no matter how mundane it seems. And this initiative, actually in the last one year, has taken off in an incredible way. Um, and you see the, the numbers, the 8,790 there refers to the number of projects that already have a zero distance that they have brought to their customers. This is out of a total of 9,500 projects that we have going on in Infosys. Um, and uh, I'm really proud of that. And of course on the breakthrough innovation I already talked about design. Uh, about MANA and, and, and next generation kinds of projects. Uh, design thinking is a very basic part of this, very fundamental part of this. The, uh, uh, therefore, teaching people design thinking was a huge initiative that we started. And uh, that is, a, by the way, a picture of our Mysore campus on the right there. Um, you see the number there of design thinking. Uh, I started a design thinking training program at Infosys uh, in October of 2014, it was uh, designed by the Stanford D School. And by now, 90,000 people of Infosys have taken this design thinking class. Uh, it is a day-long design thinking experience. So this is, in essence, what we are doing, a renew, new, and culture, renewing the company around artificial intelligence, around automation, and inspiring people to become more innovative, and doing that on a foundation of, of, uh, uh, of learning. Uh, if I had to... Uh, shrink that entire idea down to a single picture, it would be this. It used to be that services companies would send a whole bunch of people to solve a problem, people only. More and more it will have to be people plus software. The software amplifies the people. It doesn't replace the work that people do. It replaces the work that people used to do and so that people can do more, people can do new things, things that they never did before. The economic effect of this is, of course, a very positive one, um, that when you bring software to help amplify the work that people do, uh, it leads to a um, smaller number of people per project, therefore it improves the bandwidth of every project, and because the software is high margin, actually the margin on a project like this increases instead of just lowering the price on the people, and so you create a, a virtuous cycle. And that is why software, and in particular AI-based software, is so fundamental to the future of the, of the services industry. The, about 100 or so years ago, when the automobiles were first being built, 
you know, the horse carts were around. And people used to think that the automobile will never replace the horse cart for a thousand set of reasons that used to fly around. But ultimately, our automobiles did replace the horse carts. There comes a point where technology becomes so powerful that you just cannot make the horses run any faster. Um, it has to be replaced by automation. And, and yet, when you look at the, when we worry about jobs and unemployment and so forth, when you look at the unemployment rate at the time of horse carts, it was actually worse than it is now. We are okay. As long as we are able to, we'll be able to educate ourselves, as long as we'll be able to create better AI, better automation, and as long as we'll be able to leverage that to improve what we do, and as long as we'll have our imaginations intact and our education intact to be able to imagine the futures that are possible for all of us, we'll always be able to do, as Professor Mashelkar said, more with less for more. That's what we are doing at Infosys, and I believe that that is uh, how every services company will have to innovate or they will become irrelevant. Thank you very much.